for all of us. It's about predicting where the consumer is going and getting half of it right. One of the things we want to do is create ads that don't suck. Embracing change creates great possibility. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today. Today on the show, I've got Jessica Gilmartin, who's the Chief Revenue Officer for the scheduling automation platform Calendly. Decades of B2B and B2C marketing experience, Jessica works to drive adoption across sales, marketing, customer success, recruiting, and other high revenue generating teams within mid-market and enterprise companies for Calendly. Prior to Calendly, she was the head of revenue marketing at Asana. She's also served as a CMO of three high growth venture backed startups, building global enterprise marketing engines during rapid growth periods. Before that, she co-founded her own successful chain of yogurt stores in the Bay Area. On the show today, we talk about the evolution of Calendly from serving people kind of like myself, solopreneurs in this podcast business to mid-market and enterprise organizations. We talk about the transitions that they've had to go through. We also talk about the success factors of making that shift possible. We also discuss the ROI and effectiveness of marketing spend and how Jessica thinks about it and balancing the need of creativity and experimentation, and this notion that she coined creative destruction. That and much more from Jessica Gilmartin. Jessica, welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, it should be. I'm looking forward to this conversation. Before we get into talking about business, though, I have to hear about your love of baking. I do love baking. And actually, I love food. I started a a very successful food business in the Bay Area many years ago, which is, I know, not the normal for most B2B marketers. But I got really into baking when my husband was diagnosed with celiac. And he loved cookies and cupcakes and brownies and all those delicious things. And he couldn't have them anymore. And so I learned just all the ways to make delicious gluten-free baked goods. And of course, during COVID, like everybody else, I got even more into it. So I am definitely a baking fiend. And the good thing is I've got a husband and two boys. And so I don't eat it myself, but I have very uh, willing and able test cases for me. <laughs> That's uh, And making things gluten-free that taste great, it, it's, it can be done now. And it, is there any go-to substitute that you're like, You have to use this if you're doing baking. Yes, there are so many people who are celiac and I tell them the same thing every time, which is GF Jules flour. It is, it's magical and it will change your life. That's amazing. I'm going to, we may link to that so people can find it. (laughs) (laughs) That's amazing. All right, let's talk. You haven't been a baker all your life. So where'd you get your start in business? And what's been the pathway to you being now chief revenue officer at Calendly? Yeah, I definitely had a pretty non-traditional background, which I love and I think has made me just a happier, more rounded, rounded person. So I started as an investment banker. I did that for about four years and then went to business school because I knew I didn't want to be a banker, but I didn't really know what, was else, what else was out there. And I took my first marketing class at business school and I fell in love with it. I realized that's what I want to do and ended up in marketing at Dell moved out to the Bay Area, started a chain of yogurt stores, which is a whole other story that I won't get into, but sold those and um, totally fell into tech marketing and ended up at, at a startup that was bought by Google. And that really set me on a different path of being at a successful startup that was purchased, having Google on my resume. And then I became COO of a very small startup and did the startup thing for a while. And has been very lucky a year ago. I had the opportunity to interview at Calendly and it was just the perfect opportunity for me in terms of the co- company that I really respected and that I love the product and a really great size and a great stage of growth. And so it was a perfect opportunity for me. Yeah, that sounds amazing. And a great background. I have to ask about the yogurt <laughs> thing because <laughs> it really, although now you do love baking, so like maybe it's always been a little passion under the surface. I don't know. Yeah. I, I love food and I love healthy food. And, but I was just really young and naive. So I moved here and I uh, called a really good friend of mine from business school and she had just moved here. And she was like, Hey, I'm thinking about starting a business. Do you want to start one with me? And just being totally naive. I said, yes. And we spent a long time thinking about what are the, what's the intersection of things that we love to do 
and things we were passionate about and an area where we felt like there was an opportunity mm. and yogurt popped up as it does. Okay. And that's how it started. Yeah. I, my wife and I got into a franchise once, like a, a consumer franchise classes for small kids. And I think one, we learned that we should probably never go into business together, but then <laughs> two, you know, we learned a lot about each other and we're stronger on the outset. But the other thing is like retail is not for us. I don't know. It, it was, it's a hard business. Hard yeah, business. I was, we were very fortunate that it turned out financially well, but I was working 15 hours a day, seven days a week for years. And I, I sold it because I wanted to have a family and knew that lifestyle was not compatible with the way that I wanted to raise my kids. So that's why I sold it. It is a tough job and I have such respect for people that work in any capacity in the retail industry. Yeah, no, I agree. All right. So Calendly, you're now the chief revenue officer. I think that was a little bump up recently. Yes. So congratulations on that. We use Calendly for our show and scheduling and many things. And I think most people would think Calendly, it began, began as like a scheduling link and but it's evolved to serve a lot of different types of customers from people more like me, like solopreneurs in terms of podcasting to small businesses and enterprises and everything in between. Can you give us a little like walk down history lane of like where Calendly started and where you are now? Yeah, I think like most other companies, like most other you know, sort of lasting companies, it really has come from customer feedback and really wanting to do what's right for our customers. And so yeah, we basically invented the scheduling link. That's how a lot of people know us and serves millions and millions of users very well. And we just got a lot of requests. People kept saying, hey, this is great, but I have a team. And, and uh, if you're a salesperson and you have your sales engineer or you've got your manager or your customer support person that you need to bring in, the scheduling link is great, but I need to be able to coordinate with my team. And then we built lots of team features and then larger companies said, this is great, but we need administrative features and we need security. And so I think over time, we were just able to build in a lot of features really based upon the interest that we were receiving inbound. And I think at our core, though, we still are very focused on the individual user and making sure that every single individual user has a great experience, regardless of whether they are a solopreneur like you or whether they are from the Fidelities or the DocuSigns or the Elastians of the world. Love that. And it, it seems as you add more features, you're adding complexity but mm -hmm. and complexity into the product, but not in a way that's scaring away the people like me. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It, that's a real <laughs> art, I guess, art and science, but it's a real art to keep the, the simplicity, if you will. Yeah, and, and simplicity in the product as well as the messaging. And so that's what my team thinks a lot about, which is what is that... How do we tell that very complex story while also keeping it very simple? Because ultimately what we need to do is still have on that homepage the ability for somebody to come and sign up right away. We don't want to ruin that. That is precious to us. But if you are a financial services company and you want to learn about our advanced security features and our permissioning and our, the management, there has to be an easy way for you to find that. And so that's the challenging part that we're always working with is the complexity of our user base and our many different personas. And that's very typical with sort of the product-led growth. Sales-led hybrid is, and, and I previously worked at Asana and we had the exact same issue there. And it's, as you get bigger and get into the millions and millions of users, it gets infinitely more complex. And I think you've got to have amazing data, an amazing team, really good tooling for you to think about how do you segment really well at every stage of the journey, from the moment they hit your website to all of the nurture and the user experience post sign up, it's it is very complex. Mm. If, and as you move to serving more and more complex, you talked about simplicity. You talked about having the right data. Are there success factors, even either those or others, that you would point to to say that this is critical to making mm -hmm. that shift? Yeah, and I think that really, when you think about the PLG motion, the product led growth motion. It is always comes down to that individual user experience, because if every individual user is not happy, doesn't understand the product, doesn't use the product, doesn't see value, then that entire organization is not going to be successful. So I think that's something that's so important to keep in mind is that even if you sign a deal for 5,000 users within an organization, you it's not a top down model. 
Right. You don't have one person who's forcing an entire organization to use it. All of those 5,000 people have to be made successful and you have to treat every single one of those as if they are an individual user that signed up themselves. And so that is the, to me, the interesting part of the model and the complexity is building for scale, but never losing sight of that individual user and making them successful. Yeah. I'm going to date myself, but like I lived through many CRM implementations really early in my career and that notion of, yeah, we could build it, but if they don't use it, we're not getting the data, the accuracy, all the ancillary benefits that we're supposed to be getting and mm -hmm. rings true in your example of really focusing on the user, regardless of how big the organization is that they belong to. That's interesting. And, and I hadn't thought about it. I hadn't thought about it in a long time, to be honest, <laughs> but, but it makes perfect sense. It makes perfect sense. How, so as, as you think about now marketing Calendly to all these different groups and I'm, imagining that you've got at least segments that you're going after, you've got different campaigns or sub tactics that you're doing for each of them. How do you think about just ROI and the effectiveness in general of your marketing that you're doing? So we really think about it in three different ways. So we have a segment of our budget that is very clearly attached to a revenue dollar. I've committed to my CFO and my CEO that if you give me these dollars, I'm going to give you a certain dollar, certain revenue dollar back. Um, and those are your more traditional demand gen tactics. And we split that into two different paths. One is on more on the signups. We are basically driving signups for our product like growth business. And we really think about it, not just from the signup perspective, but from the revenue perspective. We really, we track very obsessively. What do those signups look like? a year later. So we're making sure that we have a really strong ROI on our spend. The second part of that demand gen spend is really helping to fuel our sales business. So we have a, an, really an account-based marketing strategy. So we look at many different types of data to be able to understand whether find those companies that we believe are in the market already for scheduling solutions. And we really try to create a kind of a surround strategy with our marketing to drive highly qualified leads for our sales team. So those are our, that's our direct response yeah. uh, budget. Then we have a third arm of our budget, which I've made it very clear is not revenue generating. We just believe that it's important for the business. And I'm lucky that I have leadership that recognizes that and willing to invest in that. And so that is things like our public relations, our analyst relations, um, our brand spends. And, and I, make it very clear that I will never promise a revenue dollar back, but I believe it's critical for awareness and brand building. And I think that helps lift all of the demand gen spend that, that we, that we spend. Yeah. You, I, I think there's a lot of marketers probably listening to this. They're going, man, I wish my CFO, my CEO would just get it. Hers does, right? It is a very envious position to be in that they you've set the guardrails, if you will, this is just not going to, it look like the other spend that I'm doing, but I agree with you. I think we've seen organizations in not too recent history stop their brand efforts or their longer term tactics. And ultimately it's hard to get off of the performance marketing crack machine, if you will. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. It's a very addictive thing of trying to just get the same signups, the same transaction velocity that you've had in the past. Yeah. And, and I think one, one thing that's really important is to make sure that you are actually fulfilling your commitments mm. on the dollars that you've said. So if you show your leadership team that you're spending the dollars wisely, mm -hmm. that you're open to feedback, if you're very communicative and transparent, you share what's gone wrong, you build that trust. Yeah. I think your team is more willing to give you latitude on those dollars that don't directly drive revenue because they know that you're doing the right thing for the business. That's a great point. Great point. So how do you, within what you're doing, how do you balance the need to drive results, but also be creative and experiment mm -hmm. and put some money at risk, if you will? I don't know that you can drive results without being creative and without experimenting all the time. I, I call it creative destruction. And my expectation with my team, and I've said this multiple times, nobody believes me, 
But my expectation is that 70 to 80% of what we're doing every quarter is new. And that is either can be a new channel, it could be new creative, it could be new messaging, it could be new audience testing. Because in marketing, the, the fun thing about marketing is that it changes all the time. So things that worked six months ago or a year ago probably don't work anymore. And so I'm constantly pushing my team. And, and I think my people that work for me get excited about this idea that a webinar, you may have a webinar series and we may know that webinars are tried and true. That doesn't mean they always have to be 60 minutes. We can try a 15 minute webinar. We can try on-demand webinars. We can try live. We can try Samu live. We have webinars now where we'll have our solutions engineers on to ask answer questions for two hours afterwards. So we're constantly just trying new things. And the key is number one is we've created an environment where failing is not, is not career ending. So it's really important for my team to know that if something doesn't go right, if something fails, uh, that's totally fine. As long as we recognize why we learn from it, we don't do it again. The second is that we, we've created an environment of data where, you know, everything has to be measured. We have to understand what are we trying to solve for and how do we know if it worked or not? And to me, the data is very much around company impact, customer impact. So it's not about the number of leads, but it's about the revenue that we're driving, or it's about the signups we're driving, or maybe it's about customer satisfaction. So we, it, it's not always the same measurement, but it has to be measured and it has to be clear why we're doing it. So that's to me really important. And I think in the world that we live in, you, you have to be willing to destroy yourself creatively or someone is going to do it for you. I love the I love that notion and phrase of creative destruction, um, and that is a healthy goal and mix of seventy. I think you said seventy to eighty percent new at any given time, and, and mm -hmm. you know, new being all those different levers that you mentioned. Um, one thing that's new now is AI, and it's you can't get away from it. Everyone's talking about it. <laughs> so, as a marketing leader, what's your take on AI and how you use it for productivity? Yes, we are legally required to talk about it at, at all times. Exactly. So I would say we are, it feels like we are at the, the peak of misrepresented expectations. I wish that were not the case. I have been severely disappointed so far in, in what I have seen from, from B2B AI technologies. I think there are places where it's worked really well. I think obviously on the content side, I think that's a no-brainer. I would say I'm not about to replace my content writers with a chatbot. But there's a place for it. And I think it is, it's very supportive for some of the work that they're doing. I think there's some really cool stuff on the video side that can be helpful. I think on the automation side and replacing humans and the promise that we, we can create more personalized experiences for our customers, I just haven't seen anything that I have been excited about. And it's made me really sad. I believe that is, I believe it's coming. I believe there's opportunity. I just haven't seen it yet. Yeah. No, I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I think the more abstraction you get from language analysis or just pure math, uh, I think is where we just have it hasn't caught up yet, right? So to your point, like content, if you have if you can train it, you have lots of information that it can use and at its disposal, probably a great great tool, right? Same as just a pure mathematical exercise, super easy. Uh, yeah. But then when you put stuff together and then it actually has to touch a human being, the complexity goes like logarithmically high. And I think to your point, like we're, you're not seeing, you're seeing promise, but not results, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I have an uh, electric car with self-driving, tons of self-driving technology in it. And it, it's great for allowing me to drive on a highway. <laughs> and stop and start, I am definitely not allowing it to drive in the San Francisco streets for me. So I think that's how I see it, see our AI technology working right now. Someday, I definitely will. It's going to be a while. I need you to talk to some of my neighbors driving those cars. <laughs> <laughs> they scare me going down the street, doing all kinds of things in the car other than with their hands on the wheel. Um, but yes, but yes, uh, we can be overconfident in our use of technology many times. Are your teams at Calendly, it sounds like you are using AI to a certain degree, like where you said content, I'm just curious if you could share a little bit about how you're using it and the type of impact you're seeing, either, even in how it might be applied inside your product. Mm -hmm. So Calendly itself. Yeah. So the way that I'm obviously very excited about 
AI within Calendly's product. And if I think about something like scheduling and making meetings more efficient, it feels like a very natural fit. And so when you think about how to use AI within Calendly, we're really thinking about how do we support the meeting life cycle? So not just the moment where somebody schedules easier, but helping you prepare for that meeting in a better way, helping you take notes in that meeting, helping you follow up in that meeting. So to me, there's a huge amount of opportunity that we're working on and we're very excited about that. I think we're going to be very careful and very measured in our approach to it because we want to make sure that whatever we are promoting and whatever we are putting out to our users is providing real value. And so it's going to be a very measured approach over the next year as we think about really enhancing our AI features within our product. So I'm excited. I'm excited to market it. I'm excited to sell it. And I think we're all excited ultimately, as always, to put our user first and really just create a much better experience for them. It's been good. One, to get to know how you're approaching marketing. I will never forget creative destruction. That's going to be my new catchphrase. And I'll try to credit you, I promise. Uh, (laughs) That's okay. I always say in marketing, we just leverage each other. So feel free to leverage it like crazy. (laughs) Yes. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Beg, borrow, and steal, I think, is another phrase I've heard. But yes, one of the things we do love to do on the show is get to know you a little bit better. We know you've got this love of baking and flower tip if you will. But my favorite question to ask everyone that comes on the show is, has there been an experience of your past that defines or makes up who you are today? Absolutely. I can point all of my success to one moment in my career. And I tell everybody about this because I think it's it's really important. And it's something that I instill obsessively in my teams, which is about accepting and embracing really hard feedback which was very hard for me to do earlier in my career. And I was at Google and I was incredibly fortunate to be accepted into a leadership program. And as part of that leadership program, they did a anonymous set of reviews with my peers. And the reviews came back in a very different way than I expected them to. And I got very difficult feedback around how I was showing up every day, which was extremely different from how I thought I was and and who I knew I was at my core. And that was, it literally changed my life because I went and I interviewed all of the folks that I knew had been asked. They were really honest with me. They gave me really tough feedback. And I realized that a lot of the fears that I had, the insecurities that I had were manifesting itself in a way that was not authentic to me. And I just changed and I changed my entire approach to how I communicated, how I was being more vulnerable, how I showed myself as not just a business person, but as a wife, as a mother. And, and it just told, that was the moment where my career took off, where people saw me as somebody that they wanted to work with. And they saw me as someone that was focused on the best interests of the company, not myself. And I've taken that with me to every single other company I've ever worked at. And I, and what people say about me now is somebody that cares deeply about others. And that is really vulnerable and really open and transparent. And I think that is so important. At least I know for me, that has been really transformational in my success in my career. And it's just made me a happier person. Yeah, I bet. It just the feedback can be a real gift if done right. And I guess a willing recipient is the word I was looking for. Um, Yeah. And what's interesting is that most companies and most people are so terrified of giving and receiving honest feedback. And a lot of people at previous companies have been punished for giving feedback and for speaking openly. And I have found at Calendly that I have to do a lot of reverse brainwashing to get people to my team to understand that it's not just welcome, but it's expected. Mm -hmm. And we have done, I'm probably on my 10th feed session with the team of giving and receiving feedback because I want people to understand that this is required to be successful here, but it's still really hard for people because it's just not a part of a normal culture. And I think that's a really huge shame. Hmm. What advice would you give your younger self if you're starting this path and journey all over? So I definitely listened to other people way too much telling me what to do with my career. And they would always, especially as I went to a lot of startups earlier in my career, it's hard to differentiate a startup versus another, right? It's, they're all a little bit of a crapshoot. And I just, I didn't listen to my gut enough. And I listened to other people telling me what I should do. And, and it was only when I listened to my instinct and I focused on 
not just the prestige or the fact that, of course, every company is going to go IPO in 18 months, which none ever did. But when I stopped listening to that, I started listening to my gut, my instinct, but I focused on what I could learn, what impact I could make. Did I love the product? Did I love the team? Did I love the culture? Could I fit in there? That's when I realized like that to me was the key to my success and, and my happiness. Is there a topic you're trying to learn more about or you think marketers need to be learning more about today? Having just taken over sales a month ago, I can say unequivocally that the more that marketers can learn about sales, salespeople, the process, the better. And I'm embarrassed to say that even though I've been at Calendly for a year running marketing, I never spent enough time with our salespeople. And now that I get to spend time with them and the marketing team is getting to spend more time with them, it's just totally game changing. And just learning from our sales team, what are customers saying to them? What resonates with them? And even hearing, hey, the emails that you think are amazing, we, it drives us crazy because those are leads that we do not like. And just all that feedback is so powerful. And so the more that marketers can learn from salespeople, the better. Hmm. Are there any trends or subcultures that you're following and you think other people should take notice of? So I believe that the, to me, the biggest opportunity uh, continues to be this, the kind of the consumerization of B2B tech. I don't think you can re- rely anymore on having a very rigid sales process. I think everything has to be around the convergence of PLG, of consumer, of attention to the user experience, in addition to being able to manage a really complex marketing and sales process. Love it. Well, last question for you. What do you think is the largest opportunity or threat? I think it's actually exactly what I just said, which is marketing was already really hard and complicated, and now it's even more hard and complicated. And I think we are expected to be magicians that can simultaneously sell to individual users and directors and C-level and recruiters and salespeople and finance people and tops down and bottoms up and sideways. And it is and with the same budget and the same headcount as before. And so I think being able to prioritize really well, being able to deeply understand your customers, having a really good sense of the data and being able to make really good, smart decisions and convince your team and your company about why you are focusing, why you're prioritizing, not trying to do everything. I think that is, to me, one of the keys to success right now. Jessica, it's been amazing to have you on and you've shared so many little nuggets. I've my sheet is all filled up on, on what I'm looking at right here. So thank you for spending the time with us. Hi, it's Alan again. Marketing Today was created and produced by me with post-production support from Sam Robertson. If you're new to Marketing Today, please feel free to write us a review on iTunes or your favorite listening platform. Don't forget to subscribe on marketingtodaypodcast.com. Tell your friends and colleagues about the show. I love hearing from listeners. You can contact me at marketingtodaypodcast.com. There you'll also find complete show notes and links to what was discussed in the episode today, and you can search our archives. I'm Alan Hart, and this is Marketing Today.